Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, it's, it's much easier when everyone's called Paul, I find. So, uh, first, very short, uh, the agenda. Uh, I'm, first, I'm going to talk about the background to this work, uh, where it's come from, the problems it's trying to solve, and then I'm going to move on to the scary bit, for, for me at least, which is the, the demo of the, the tools that I've written. And assuming that goes reasonably well, I'll, I'll wrap it up with some conclusions and we'll go from there. Um, but first, the hidden agenda. Um, what I'm interested to hear from, from you is whether you think this idea is a generally, generally sound one, whether there's anything really obvious I've missed. Um, it's ambitious, certainly. Um, is it something that should be an LVM, perhaps? Um, and as I talk, undoubtedly you, it's going to occur to you that there are any number of projects that are potentially related. Some, hopefully most, uh, complementary relationship. But there may be conflicting rela from relationships with other projects, so I would love to hear from the respective owners what you think. And if there are problems to solve, then we can look at solving them. Um, it's going to be, of necessity, it's going to be a, a 10,000 foot high level overview. And in a room full of engineers who tend to s uh, obsess about details, that might freak you out. So I apologize. I'm deliberately not going to talk about some stuff. Um, ask me afterwards if it, if it really does cause you pain. So the, the background. Um, I have got some numbers generated from building the Chromium browser. This is a, uh, a vanilla checkout from open source. I've modified the build to enable a minus F time report for each of the source files and then captured the file that came out and then parsed out from that the amount of time spent in Clang plus the IR generation compared to the amount of time that we spend doing everything else, so all of the instruction selection, the, all the various option optimizations, the object file generation, divided one number by the other, and then sorted them by time so that it's not just noise. Uh, on the x-axis, you have each of the roughly 16,000 source files that make up the, the Chromium build. Um, and I've done each of them 16 times to try and eliminate the, the timing errors. The timing errors in this are very small, so I'm not showing them. In a release build, as you'd expect, we spend a lot of time in the optimizer, thinking hard and doing clever things to make the program better. In a debug build, we spend a lot less time proportionally, but we're still spending a lot of time in the back end generating code. So this project is aimed at reducing as much of that orange section as possible. So as I go through the rest of the slides, bear in mind that orange block is the thing that I'm shooting at. And to put some, some numbers on there, in the release build, we're spending roughly 81% of our time in the back end, but, but for me at least, that we still spend 60%, for this project at least, in the back end of the compiler is surprisingly high. Uh, to slice the numbers up a slightly different way, I've also counted the number of CONDAT groups that the compiler is generating. Uh, on the x-axis here, we've got the number of times each one of those CONDATs was produced, and on the y-axis, the total size of each instance. Uh, the scale is logarithmic, obviously on the left, so bear that in mind when you're looking at it. And in an ideal world, you would want the compiler to generate one and only one copy of each CONDAT. In other words, all of those exit, all of those crosses will be hard to the left of the, the graph. But as you can see, we've generated 480 copies of some of them. Um, those are relatively tiny, sort of 10, 20 bytes. But in the top right-hand corner of the graph, we've generated maybe 360 copies of something that's not short of 10 kilobytes, and that's cost quite a lot of time. And of course, the, the linker will throw away every, all but one of those copies. And to put some hard numbers on that, we've generated 577,000 CONDATs, and the linker's going to throw away 576,000 of them, which is pretty bad, I think you'll agree. 
Now, just to be clear, I'm not criticizing the compiler in any way, shape, or form. It has no choice. The, the, the architecture we have for, com, for Comdat and the way that we do uh, weak linkage, not, not weak linkage, vague linkage, demands this. But there's a problem I think we can solve. So to wit, the, to the toy tools. Now, I've got to do a, a, a fair amount of expectation management <laughs> up front. Uh, um, it's a programming language I invented myself. Um, it was designed entirely to be easy, to, very easy to write a compiler for. If you've ever done any PostScript programming or fourth programming or used an HP calculator even, then you might feel at home. But it was created for this demo and only this demo. I don't imagine anybody ever writing a program in it. All the code that I'm about to run is on GitHub. There are the conventional sets of tools, the compiler, the linker, the debugger. There's a runtime which runs the program because it just doesn't generate native code because that's hard. Uh, three more tools which, are, which exist to support the program repository. Uh, and I'll get to them as you see the tools. This is showing you the conventional workflow that we're all familiar with. You start off with your two source files in this case. You throw them through the compiler. Out comes object files. Those go into the linker. Produces the native binary to run on the target. And we, um, I've got a, a virtual machine and a debugger shown on the chart as well. To that mix, I'm adding a central repository for all of the information that the compiler is going to generate and then adding in all of these links. So now the compiler and the linker and the other tools have a bi-directional communication link to the place where all of this data is going to be stored. They can query and find out what they did the last time so that they don't do it again. More expectation management. It's just a toy. Um, the tools as they stand are written in Python. I don't want the world to think I'm a Python programmer, but that's what I chose. Um, the output files are all YAML, and that was chosen simply so that it's easy to see what's going on inside these, these files that would normally be binary. So the, the object files, the, the executables, the, the repository itself, they're all YAML. Partly as a consequence of that, you can't do parallel builds. Uh, any real toolchain would obviously have to consider backward compatibility. You'd have to work with all of the object files and archives that we have today. I didn't even give that a moment's thought when producing these tools. Uh, and because of everything I've said, you can't, I can't make any claims about the performance of the system from this. Perhaps uh, the toy language itself is nothing at all like C++, which is what we're all targeting, or what most of us are targeting anyway. Um, we've got no registers and stacks instead. It's dynamic. I'm hoping that, the, that it's close enough that you can see how it could be applied to a C++ development system. So the demo is in three parts. First one is Hello World, and that's because you have to have a Hello World demo. Uh, the main demo is the, the, the modules one, which is where I'm going to take a program split into three modules and compile and link the, the modules separately. And then the last one, the distributed demo, is, is showing how this might work in a distributed environment. So, oh, no, you're not supposed to see that yet. Okay, so here are the, the, this is what you get when you check out from the GitHub repository. Most of those directories are the Python modules making up the tools, but the interesting bit is the samples. Let me just get all the paths set up. And then we've got the three demos in here. So. There's a, uh, let me just show you the source code for the Hello Toy program, and this just puts the string Hello World on the stack, on the stack and calls print. And if I make it, these are, I'll run it just for, so that you can, hello dot x, it says Hello World. Now the, the crucial thing here is the, are the messages that the compiler is emitting. So from the first one, you can see that it's created a new program repository to hold all of the data the compiler is going to generate. Then the compiler is going to perform code generation for the main function, first time it's seen it. We are then going to write the procedure 
because that's what I've called functions for reasons that I can't remember, um, to the repository and associate it with a digest derived from the source code. And then finally, it writes hello.o, and I'm, I'm calling these things tickets rather than object files, and I think you'll see why. If we explore some of the object, some of the files that it's created, we now have the traditional.o file, except now it contains nothing more than a unique ID. The, the binary, YAML kind of makes this easy to read and kind of not at the same time. The actual executable code is this ASCII 80, 85 encoded instruction sequence. And then we've got the list of debug info records that tell the debugger what to, what to go and look at. And then finally some symbols which are needed for the runtime. Uh, there's a UUID in there, but that doesn't matter at the moment. So if I show you the contents of the repository that we have, uh, it's good to see it now because the, it gets pretty big pretty quickly. Um, the repository contains three major elements, at least in this iteration of the, of the tools. It has fragments, uh, links which are, turn that off, which have the, the native links in them. Why don't I just double click? easier. And it has a tickets member. Uh, and the tickets, this UUID matches the contents of hello.o hello that we generated. I'll take my word for it for a moment. And the ticket contains the list of members that that source file had at the point that we compiled it. So there's a digest, which was the source for function main. And that digest will match a digest in the key in the fragments table. And a fragment consists of a number of sections. Uh, so that a, an individual fragment contains everything that you need to know about an individual function or global data object. It contains its code, its data, its EH frame records, debug info, everything that you everything that's associated with that function is bundled up in that, inside that fragment. Let's go back to the shell. Okay. Let's move on to the slightly more exciting demo. This one has three source files, like I mentioned. I'll just show you the source code, just, uh, that's main. It calls, it calls civ, which does a prime number civ, and it calls fact3, which computes factorial3, unsurprisingly. Uh, if I show the civ code, there it is. Uh, the factorial code is much simpler. But the function we're interested in at the moment is fact3, which simply pushes 3 on the stack and then calls factorial. So this is just a, a very simple function. If I compile that, you can see that, uh, like before, we create a brand new repository the first time we, we compile something, and then this is the first time we're seeing any of these functions, so we're doing code generation for main. We write the ticket that represents, that, that stands instead of main.o, and then we do the code generation for the various functions in here and do the same, and so on. It gets more interesting if I edit factorial, and I've decided that actually that was wrong, and what I should be computing is the factorial. Oh, I've forgotten to run the pro forgotten to run the program. Let's just let me back that out. Divmn.x. When you run it, it prints out some prime numbers and three factorial. Okay. If I then edit the factorial source file, change three factorial to four factorial, and then rebuild it. Make has realized, obviously, that I've only modified one source file, so it just comp compiles factorial.toy. Then it realizes, and the compiler realizes, that we've already seen the source code for factorial, and it's recorded in the repository. 
So it completely strips that from the compiler IR, meaning that we only need to do code generation for fact three, because that's, that's a function we haven't seen before. The, co the code was different, so we need to do something different. We write the ticket for the file, and we're done. And if I run it this time, get the cursor in the right place. Instead, it prints 24 at the end, which hopefully is four factorial. Now if I decide that three fact actually really should compute three factorial and change it back, and redo the, the build, this time the compiler realizes that we've already seen that. We saw that a couple of compiles ago, so we don't need to do any code generation for that. And likewise for factorial. So this time, the compiler did nothing more than write a ticket file. It generated a UUID, put a couple of entries in the repository. There was no code generation done at all that time. And if I can go one step further, and I do want fact four factorial, because four factorial is fascinating. I can actually, let's call it four fact, fact four, which makes a bit more sense. And let's add some comments in here. Really three fact. And compile it. Again, the compiler's done nothing. It's seen the code, it's seen the source code for four factorial, it's seen the, code, the source code for, for fact three, even though I added a comment to it, because obviously that, that's not present in the, or at least in this implementation, is not present in the IR in any, so you can change, so long as you don't change the relative source locations of the, the files, of the functions, you can move the starting point of the function around and it still won't need compiling or it still won't need re-code re generating. Um, let me show you what's going on under the hood. That's where this big scary diagram comes in. We've got the three source files, the three, three ticket files, rather, on, on the left of the diagram. Main.o, siv.o, factorial.o, each with their own unique ID in them. Those are references into the ticket state tickets table in the repository, and the tickets table connects the unique ID to the collection of global names that were present in that module, and their corresponding source digest. The corresponding, the source digest then maps to a key in the fragments table, so that you can see from this that presented with a ticket file, you can then find the binary for the functions that were contained within that, that were produced by that compilation. Uh, you can see that I've, I've shown the fragments containing text in the H frame, um, but as I mentioned, that, that can be anything to do with the function. It could be just the bit code, it could, the debug info will probably, would lie in there with the exception of types. Um, but if anything to do with that function is bundled in that fragment. When we recompiled factorial.o to produce factorial prime, it has a new unique ID, which references a new entry in the tickets table, which references, in this case, we changed, one func we changed the definition of one function. So there is a new fragment to represent that new version of the function, but the ticket table entry refers to one of the pre-existing fragments as well. So you can see here, we, we should be able to use this to eliminate all of the duplication as a result of condat and um, save the compiler a lot of time in that process, just by referring to the pre-existing pre fragments. Uh, the linking phase is different in this model as well. Um, when you have the collection of ticket files presented to the linker, say in this example we've got uh, main.o, zip.o, and the second version of factorial, then those, I've missed something, back up a bit. Um, I haven't talked about the internal fix-ups and the external fix-ups tables. The fix-ups are equivalent to relocations in traditional object files. Uh, internal fix-ups are used to describe the relationships between the sections of a fragment, 
and external fix-ups are used to define the relationships from between, between fragments. So one fragment refers to another fragment using its name via the external fix-up. So go back to the ticket files. You present the set of ticket files to the, to the linker. The linker then knows the collection of fragments that need to be linked into the program that represent what was compiled, represent the result of those compilations. The external fix-ups can then be resolved because we know, now know the name to digest mapping. And from this, along with the entry point, which the linker knows, which the linker knows anyway, we now know the complete program graph. So if I throw away all of the extraneous stuff. So this is the linker's view of the program at link time where all it has to do is start at the entry point and walk the graph, copying the fragments to the native binary that it's going to produce. So moving on uh, to how that, one, one of the problems that this creates is that I'm building up effectively a whole program view. The if you try distributing that to multiple machines, obviously you break that. Uh, all of a sudden, one, no one machine, at least potentially, gets to see the entire program. So, which asks the question, begs the question whether the repository should be a network resource. And I think you can answer this question both ways. I think both, both answers are perfectly reasonable. And yes, has some distinct advantages because you can share the compilations across between users even. But for the purposes of this, I've decided to answer it no, just to prove that the model can be made to work, even if there's no sharing of the repository itself. So this diagram aims to show how it works. We start with four source files, two remote agents that are going to do the compilations. The distributed build system pushes the source files to the remote agents, just as it does today. I'm not trying to get the temporal order correct. This is just trying to show the general flow. We then run the strip utility on the repository. And what this does is it removes the bodies of all of the fragments, all of the ticket records, and everything. So the, the repository just gets reduced, in effect, to a big list of hashes. Those much, much smaller files are then pushed out to the remote agents. And the compiler operates as normal. It, all it's doing is saying, do you have this fragment? Do you have this, do you have this digest? Do you have this digest? Do you have this digest? And if the answer is no, it goes ahead and does the, the code gen and records the fragment in the repository. It produces the tickets just as normal. It doesn't know that any of this is happening. The tickets and the interim repositories are then brought back to the initiating machine. And then we want to run a merge process. And this copies the new fragments into the original repository. And one thing I should point out is that because I've distributed this out to two machines, I haven't made the, I've, the combat problem has come back to some extent. The same definition may be in more than one repository. The merge utilities job is to resolve that and reduce it to just one copy. Um, hopefully you have fewer agents, fewer distributed build agents than source files, in which case you've got even though the Comdat problem is back to some degree, it's, it's much, much reduced than it was when we started. And then, as normal, the repository and the four ticket files are sent to the linker to produce the, the final binary. And I've tried to simulate that. In the distributed demo. This has three source files, which it pushes to two directories, called one called agent one and one called agent two, which are standing instead of real remote machines. So hopefully you'll forgive the, the shonky mock-up. If I do a make on that, you can see that we run make an, an agent one, which is going to compile the 
the two files remotely there. We do a make on agent two, which compiles the two files remotely there. And this is all happening as, as it did before. Then we do a merge to produce the, the final repository, which has all the definitions of the remote compilations, along with everything that we started with at the beginning. And finally, the link happens just as normal. I haven't mentioned the garbage collector. The job of the garbage collector, obviously, as because you're modifying code, you're adding code, you're deleting code, and all of this stuff is just building up and building up and building up in the repository. The idea here is that the garbage collector runs pe periodically when the machine is idle, or when there's so much cruft that we just need to, to clean up all of the dead stuff. And we use the existence, or otherwise, of the corresponding ticket file to tell us whether a fragment is alive or dead, whether it needs to be collected. Not just the ticket file, the, the native binary can contain links into the debug records in the, in the repository. We don't, copy, don't need to copy them to the final binary. Uh, okay. Come on. No, that was a bad choice. So, challenges. There are plenty of those. It's a fairly ambitious project, as you can see. Um, this is very much just a toy. It was written in a couple of weeks to win an argument, um, which, which obviously I did. Um, <laughs> I, it needs a proper implementation, obviously. Um, the real-world growth rates and, the, and tuning the, the garbage collection strategy may be tricky and getting the garbage collector to run so that it's almost completely unobtrusive. And here I'm not showing solutions to how the storage might work. Obviously, I, we have, currently we rely a lot on the file system to uh, enable our parallelism of our builds, because we just write to the object files and, and the op operating system sorts it out for us. I've just moved all of that up into user space, so that's now our problem to deal with. Uh, I need to be able to efficiently hash functions, including all of their dependents, including all the types. And I need to be able to refer efficiently. I haven't shown anything to do with debug types, but I need to be able to sort out the efficient references from one type to another, because I've broken all of the translation unit boundaries. So a conclusion. If you believe the numbers, the Chrome numbers, then there's the potential to reduce recompilation times. The initial compilation is you, you have to do. Uh, or at least the, the non-conduct parts of it, um, by 60% based on a sample of one or 16,000, depending on your point of view. I've got numbers for Clang, and they're, they're in the ballpark, so the compiler should be considerably improved. I, can't, I don't have any hard data to show it, but my theory is that most changes that you made between compilations are relatively small. You're changing a plus one to a minus one, a less than to an equals. So, and those will benefit the most, where that you, you change the minimum amount of source code. It doesn't require any source changes on the part of the user. It will work with all, ex all the existing source code. And the goal is to eradicate all of the duplication and redundancy that the compiler in particular, but the, but the linker as well at the source as early as possible in the whole chain of events. We minimize the link time processing and copying. I don't have to copy the debug info because that just stays in the repository where it belongs. The graph walk means that you just don't visit dead code, and so you, you don't have a specific option to eliminate dead code. It just doesn't get copied. And there's very nearly no change to any of the workflows. The distributed build scenario is a little bit different, but I hope we can hide that inside the tool that's doing the distribution so the user won't actually see it. Um, next steps, at least I think, until I'm told otherwise, are to complete work on the data store. that We've, we've got an implementation underway. It's an in-process, effectively a memory mapped hash table. We need to figure out whether that's gonna give us the performance we think it is. And prototype the, the IR hashing get an MC backend written, which instead of writing to object files, writes fragments, and write a linker that will read from the repository. Thank you for listening.
and I'm ready for any nice, easy questions you have. <laughs> okay, uh, we have the usual microphone in the middle, or I can uh, run one to somebody. Go ahead, Sorry, Sorry if, I'm, if I missed this, but how do you deal with the effects um, between different functions, like, for example, with inlining? So if you modify one function, um, actually that can affect how that gets inlined in other places. How, how do you model that? I'm, I'm imagining that the IR, is compute, the IR hash is generated after inlining. I think that's the earliest point that I can do it. I'd love to do it earlier, but. Hey, cool talk. Uh, I work on Chrome and I've uh, profiled Clang like when it's compiling some of the source files in Chrome and your like, curve doesn't match what I usually see. Usually I see like most of the time in the front end and usually dash f time report doesn't match what the profiler shows me. So I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm curious if you could uh, like, share how you collect that data. Uh, yeah, but I'm planning. I don't. I haven't been through all the internal processes yet, but I'm planning to release the the tool that I use to generate that. Cool. Thanks. What about pre-compiled headers? Would those go into your repository or not? They certainly could do. Um, I don't have a strong feeling on it, if I'm honest. The, the, the pre-compiled headers could well go into, into the repository, or if you're using the, the Microsoft-style modules implementation where they have IFC files, they could also be recorded in the repository. But equally, they can stay as files in the file system as they are today. But you want to get rid of redundant computation and reparsing and relaxing the header files is a significant amount of the front-end work. Yes, but the, the pre-compiled headers achieve that already, don't they? I don't know if I have a nice and easy question. <laughs> you, you can tell me. Um, yeah, I don't know how to pull it up. Um, so first, a great uh, talk and great job. Um, <laughs> that's very interesting. And one year ago, I tried to do a similar thing. And we experimented about generating one function per object file to be able to have those kind of yeah. incremental yeah. build with C++. And uh, there are a lot of challenges. And uh, at some point, I had other problems to solve. And you saw it maybe this morning. <laughs> we were very busy. And we had just a coarse grain incremental build. So there are a lot of challenges. Microsoft did it with their incremental link. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think uh, I'm very impressed by all what you've put together. And something that is key, I feel, in what you're doing is that you're intermediate. You, you're breaking the object format that exists, yeah, exactly. right? Yes. And that was a bit of my conclusion when I tried to do it, that we kind of need to rework the full tool chain. And, um, Which so, is why it's a scary project, right? So I don't know if you were like looking to, because you said you mentioned C plus plus, right? Which yeah. is a goal. So yes. obviously we're not going to do it with YAML and such. So it's going to be designing a new linker format, a new object format, and mm -hmm. everything, right? So that's where you're aiming for. That's where we're heading. Yes. So yeah, I think it's a very exciting project. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I look forward. I hope uh, you're going to work in the open, and I think I'll have me. It's a great place to start Thank you. with that. Certainly, certainly that's the aspiration at this point. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and my question was, that was more general comments, but my question is, did you see the talk from Daniel Dunbar yesterday? I did. And what do you think are the I, implications? I think there's a, there's an, uh, I think they have a very complementary relationship, is my initial, uh, initial take on what he said that his focus seems to be on reducing the amount of work that Clang has to do by bundling up as many, as many translation units as possible invisibly inside the build system. And I think that fits very nicely with the idea of reducing the amount of work the back end has to do. Right. I, I cannot answer for him, but sure. like the fact that currently the boundaries between compiler and build system is not well necessarily, it's more, mostly history and we need to break the yes. history to move forward yes. with new models. Yes. And I felt there were some synergy and some commonality. In yes. What you were looking for. Yeah, absolutely. I agree completely. So I'm very excited to work with you. 
If there are no other questions, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much.